help us in our femininity journey, Father God, and in our relationship with you. So we just thank you for how you're about to move among us, Father, and we just give you the honor and the glory. It's in the precious name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. So welcome again, ladies. I want to know who's excited to be here, if you can. Um, before we start, I do ask that if you're able to, to please turn on your cameras. But I do want to see reactions. I want to see emojis. Type in the chat who's excited, what you're most excited about. I see some reactions. <laughs> I'm going to give you all some time to type. <laughs> but yeah, welcome. Whoever's just coming in, we're just typing like what we're excited about, typing the fact that we're even excited to be here. Abigail says, me, I'm excited. I'm excited too, sis. Like, <laughs> I'm ready for all the gem uh, gems that'll be dropped on today or tonight, depending on where you are. Anybody else excited? Tiffany says she's excited. Okay, Itu says she's excited. Oh, I'm excited to see y'all too. Okay, okay, everybody's coming in with the messages. I'm so excited to be here. And I do want to welcome you guys to Godly Fem. Um, this is Charge It to the Game, Christian Hypergamy 101. If that doesn't sound like a gem, I don't know what does. <laughs> but really quickly, we're going to start by um, giving you guys the breakdown of what to expect. So right now we're currently at the welcome. Next, we'll be going into the poll icebreaker. Um, you'll be given more detail about that shortly. We'll learn about Jamoke and Godly Fem. The next part will be all about hypergamy. Part after that will be about the provider men. You wanna know about hi um, hypergamy and then the men that you need to get to hypergamy and how to prepare to live hypergamously. There'll be a giveaway. And finally, we'll tie everything in a nice sweet bow with a Q&A at the end. So for now, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Miss Christiana for the icebreaker. Hi, ladies. I hope we are all excited for this webinar. I know I'm really excited for it. So I hope all of us are. Put in the chat as well where you guys are from. I would love to know where everyone's tuning in from because I know it's not just going to be, as you can hear, I've got, if you're from the States, I've got an accent. I don't think I have an accent because I'm from the UK. But yes, yeah, so I'm from the UK and I'm sure there's lots of different different places. Oh, we got UK Birmingham. Come on. Come on, UK. We got Houston, Texas, South Florida, got Maryland. I got family in Maryland. Indiana. Ooh, so we got UK and US anywhere. Oh, Lagos, Nigeria. That's exciting. All right, keep dropping in the in the chat where you guys are from. I am just going to share with you guys a um poll which I would like you to answer. And we're going to discuss. So I'm going to just launch that. There we go. So something should have popped up on your screen where you can answer the questions and we'll, we'll speak about the results afterwards. Have we all had something pop up with the polls? If anyone's having any issues, please just drop in the chat. I promise that we trust you even through this storm. Now it's time to prove that I'm a dear. I will keep my eyes on the blue sky. 
Fingers on the strings, I'm finding you cry. I know it's not much, but it feels right. I haven't forgot what you've done for me. Always taking care of my every need. You do what you say, you say what you mean. Jesus says, I'm open now, that give you guys a few more minutes to answer the questions. I'm going to look through the chat again, see where people are from. Oh, you're from Robert says she's from New York, but she's now living in Atlanta. We've got another person here from Atlanta as well, so that's exciting. Lots of people everywhere. Welcome, welcome, ladies. The new ladies I have just joined in. This is Charge It to the Game, Christian Hypergamy 101. Okay, okay. So, just going to go through all the questions. Going to share the results as well. So, first question was How well do you understand hypergamy? One being low to no understanding, and five master so these are the results i believe you guys can see them so yes so 29 percent on one 24 percent on two 29 percent on three 12 percent on four and only six percent of you are experts for me personally i'm very much middle ground you know a little bit but there's always more to learn so yeah so that's exciting um what do you want this question I'll, I'll ask out to people. What do you want to learn the most about Christian hypergamy? If you drop that in the chat. how to include God in it. That is amazing. Yeah. How to switch from being super independent. Yeah, definitely. I can agree. I can definitely relate to that one. Live in hypergamy. Yeah, that's great. God's intention for it for his daughters. That is amazing. We'll take them more. Where to find provider men? What about women? Appeals to them first glance as gets to know her. Yeah, love that. Love that. Love that. Okie dokie, how it benefits and protects wives. That is that is a very, 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 very good point for sure. Benefits and how to meet provider men. So yeah, so I feel like we're all kind of on the same page. Lots about benefits, you know, how to meet provider men, how it protects us as wives, etc. So yeah, that is great. Um, I can see your answers for, yeah, so here are a few answers. So what are your turnoffs about hypergamy, if any? So um, one of you says, usually spoken about from worldly perspectives. Absolutely. So we're going to get a little glimpse today about it from a biblical perspective, which is what we want. Um, somebody else said, I'm wary of going for a small percentage of men, but I don't honestly want anything else so yeah that is yeah that is one of the worries for people i'm sure um i know this says not turn off but i want to understand from a christian perspective yes definitely 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 um another person says i think maybe i have a fear that marrying a guy who doesn't need my money means i won't have the option to work outside of the home if i wanted to no definitely i can i can relate to that in some sense there we go right here Right, number four, have you ever dated a provider man or are you married to one? So 38% have said yes, 
and 62% have said no. So more people have said no that they've not dated provider men, you know. So, wow. That is, yeah, I, didn't, I thought it might have been about 50-50, about but no, it's 62 to 38. So that's very interesting. Very, very interesting. And finally, do you think hypergamy for, is for you? Why or why not? So one of you have said, not sure. I'm curious to see what this is about. Then I can decide. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't know. We like the honesty here. Um, another one straight to the point. Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, and then another one. Yes, I seek hypergamy because I feel it's the main way to live out the biblical role of a wife in the US. Many of us in the US have an inflated expectation of standard of living here too. Um, another one, not sure. And another one says, yes, with multiple S's. It's for me with my full chest. I love that for you. Absolutely. With your chest, say with your chest. I love that. So yes. Um, yes, I do. I wish to be married is another answer. And uh, someone else says, yes, I think so. Because when I have children, I'm not going to be working two or three jobs to provide for them. I hear you on that one for sure. For, for sure. And there's quite a few more answers, but you will all get a chance to like connect and ask more questions afterwards. But yes, I'm going to pass you on to the woman of the hour, Mrs. Jumoke Wynn. And she is going to talk to us about charging it to the game, Christian Hypergamy one Oh, one. Ooh. Hold on. Let me replace the spotlight. How is everyone doing? Some one of my mentees, she didn't get the memo. She couldn't find the link. So here we go. All right. Let us continue with this program. So, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jumoke Wynn. Nice to meet all of you. Are you guys excited? Is everybody excited to be here, huh? Woo yes. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Thank you guys so much for jumping on um, for this webinar. This is going to be super juicy, super juicy. So, for some of you, you may not know who I am, you know, <laughs> you may not know who I am. Um, maybe you just got um, in touch with me. Perhaps you had a friend send this to you. Maybe you saw this on Godly Thumbs page or you saw it somewhere. So however way you got here, we are grateful that you took the time on your MLK day, your day off to be here. Do they have MLK in, um, I don't think so, in the UK? Oh, no. no. Ooh, never mind. <laughs> we got the day off today. So, you know, my president is black. Okay. So <laughs> um, before we talk about um, Charge It to the Game, Hypergamy 101, Christian Hypergamy 101, I want to talk to you a little bit about who I am, about my story, and how we all got here. Why are we all here today talking about Hypergamy What a Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey and then we're going to go into hypergamy. Okay, so I um, had a coming of age moment when I got saved around 21. I got saved at 20. Um, and then when I turned 21, there was something in me. I'm like, I want to be a woman. Okay, <laughs> like I got close with God and I'm just like, I just want to be a woman, you know? Now, back then, this is 2015, okay? Femininity didn't really pop off. I don't think femininity really popped off until like a few years ago. Um, so what I knew was more of like, this was a womanhood type of journey. So I'm like, okay, I want to grow as a woman of God. I just don't know how. So I started to do the very practical things first, right? I got into like fragrances and I learned about scents because before that I was just using dial soap. I'm telling you guys, I was a little girl. <laughs> I was using dial soap and water and some body mist. Okay. Like I was not 
like elevated when it came to my presentation. But I'm like, okay, I want to have white teeth. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get my hair done. Um, okay, this is when like wigs start to become a thing, like lace fronts and stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was making my own wigs and stuff. And I said, all right, so you know, I was, I, I was, I was, you know, pushing. <laughs> I was, I was, you know, trying to trying to do something. So first I started working on the most practical thing was presentation. Then I started learning about organization. Um, Holy Spirit actually led me to like an organization book because before I started my, which now I understand is a femininity journey, I was very disorganized. Um, I was very insecure. You know, I just was, again, a little girl. <laughs> Um, Holy Spirit started to lead me to some resources and just certain things. I remember the first thing the Holy Spirit told me to do to combat laziness was to make my bed, right? And I'm like, make my bed every morning. That's not what I asked for. <laughs> I'm like, how, how is that going to make me stop being lazy? Um, but through there, I just was obedient and I would make my bed in the morning. I would wash my dish when I was done using it because I didn't learn these things at home. So now this is a college and I'm learning these things. And I realized I said, oh, wow, my space and the home that I'm keeping really um, affects who I am as a person. It affects my mood. It affects uh, my esteem, my self-esteem. Who knows how it's going to affect my children if I don't, you know, get this, <laughs> um, get this under control. So Anyways, femininity, what it was a thing, but biblical, oh, femininity, ooh, okay. Femin femininity was not a thing. Sorry, that's a mistake right there. But biblical womanhood was, all right? So again, I was learning about biblical womanhood and then I even did a whole, um, what's it called? I did a, a Bible study. It was a video I made on YouTube. This is maybe a year or two later about the Proverbs 31 woman. Cause I said, okay, I started, I said, okay, so this is what I gotta do. <laughs> and I just started to really learn about myself as a woman and my identity um, by spending time with God and through studying the word. So over the years, I went on the self-love level up femininity journey. And um, the more I started to learn about my identity and the and life purpose, it became very clear the type of lifestyle that I wanted to have. Right. I remember this was the day I think I think I was 24. I want to say 24. Um, it was 23 or 24. And I was praying into uh, my birthday. It was like around midnight and I was praying to my birthday or maybe it was the day of it's kind of fuzzy. And I remember the Lord showed me a glimpse of what my life could look like. And I said, I want that. <laughs> it was so quick. It was like a quick vision, but I knew that's what I wanted. I knew that was the direction I was going. So over the years, the Lord really began to do a work in me. Okay. Like I said, the more time I'm spending with God, God's asking me questions like, what do you want? And I said, ah. <laughs> I said, ah. you know, I was kind of, Again, I, I wasn't at that place mentally to tell the Lord boldly what I wanted. I kind of believed in life just happening, right? Like you just take life as it comes. You go with the grain. You just do what everyone else is doing. You do what your parents say. I never really had a strong vision for my life myself, right? But then over time, um, yeah, this was around 24, like my mid-20s. When I sat down with the Lord and I wrote down what I want, I said, okay, well, I want to be an um, entrepreneur because I realized I had that gift. Uh, but I also wanted to, um, how do I say, keep the home, right? I started to develop more of a pull towards the home, towards parenting. I saw these things as integral, especially for society. And with my own journey too, and just looking at other people, I'm like, hmm, how we're parenting and raising kids, something ain't right, right? I said, something is 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 amiss with this generation. And um, I just took that more seriously. I took that calling more seriously, but I thought that was just a personal calling for me. I remember I, I had one job, I think one real job, and I said, mm, nope. 
<laughs> I said, mm, nope, nope, nope. I think I lived on my own and I was paying some big girl bills. And I said, oh, mm -mm, oh, no, no. <laughs> and I said, I don't like this. This is ghetto. <laughs> and uh, for me, I just was never pulled to be a career driven, education focused woman. Not to say I didn't want to go back to school, maybe to do like a doctorate in like psychology, but I just knew ultimately I wanted to be a stay at home mom. Right. And that's just what I saw for myself. I'm like, I would rather work on a family business from home or work on some type of side hustle from home, but to sit, eh, do I want to go work 40, 60 hours a week and try to raise kids? You know, that just wasn't the pull that I was receiving. I'm like, I really don't like this idea of all the financial burden being on me. Okay. I'm like, if I'm how, how many kids I want to have, like at least four. And I said, huh, I don't know how it's going to work. Right? <laughs> so this, this was how I was thinking. And again, I thought this was just a personal conviction for me, right? This wasn't necessarily something that um, women had to do, right? But it was just something I would say for me. Okay, let me go to the next slide. So like I said, because I thought this was just a personal calling for years, I poured into this vision and I practically prepared myself to be a hypergamous wife. Okay. So let me backtrack a little bit. What is hypergamy? Just the very basic definition. We're going to go more into it, but it means to marry into an equal or higher social class. In the way that we're talking about it, if I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, well, <laughs> well, if I if the financial burden is not going to be on me and I'm going to pour my energies into the home, into the kids, and into our family business, there is not much time for me to excel in a career, to leave the home, to do these different things. Like, you know, I, I can't do it all. I know women say, oh, you can do it all. I'm like, oh, I wanted the flexibility, um, you know, to be able to stay at home. Now, Obviously, being a straight stay-at-home mother is not the only way to be hypergamous. There are some women who do part-time. There's some women who have very not stressful jobs, um, but we'll get into that in a bit. So anyways, I practically prepared myself to be a hypergamous wife. Like I learned about uh, keeping the home, home management. I learned about parenting. Um, I disciplined myself in a lot of different areas. Um, I worked on my presentation. I, what else did I do? Oh, I learned about home decor and how to decorate a home, um, how to have a vision for our family, how to plan certain things, how to manage a budget. These are practical skills that that's what I spent my 20s doing. You know, I didn't spend my 20s chasing a career. I went to school, I got a degree in computer engineering and I said, I'm finished. <laughs> so, I'm done. <laughs> People are saying, hey, are you going to go back to do your master's? No. <laughs> hey, you know, you know, I had a job recently and they're like, yeah, you know, eventually you can take um, your supervisor's position and you could be the CMO of the company. I just looked at him like, I'm just a poker face because I said, <laughs> I said that was not my desire to rise up in the ranks of um, a company I was working for. I said, look, man, I'm just here to cut a check to support myself while I'm single. <laughs> but I didn't tell them that. But, you know, I, I wasn't focused on trying to climb the corporate ladder. This is what I poured all of my energy into was into being a hypergamous wife. So when I finally opened myself up to dating, um, if some of you know me from When at Love, maybe you've heard my testimony. I was single for six years and I got married in six months, okay? Um, part of the reason why I was single for six years is because I was under the deception of the one doctrine, which we're not gonna get into because it's a hypergamous, um, <laughs> a hypergamous webinar. But when I started to come out of that deception, right? I said, okay, I started to just open myself up to the idea of just entertaining men. Now, I didn't realize this, but I was subconsciously only entertaining provider men and dating hypergamously. It wasn't a conscious thing. It was just the idea of the type of husband and the vision of the type of husband that I had just matched um, you know, what a provider was and, you know, dating and living hypergamously. 
So I, I don't know about you guys, but I never imagined myself marrying a bum. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. You know, a man whose pants are sagging who say, hey, little mama. I don't know. That one was not my own. Okay. <laughs> That's not what I wanted for my life. That's not what I wanted for myself. <laughs> um, so usually I dated men who are in the professional um, climate. Okay. Usually men who were in STEM, right? Men who were lawyers. In my mind, I always thought I was going to marry a Yoruba, a dark-skinned Yoruba doctor from the UK. That's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> for six years, I mean, you know, I love my husband, but this is what I thought, okay, for many years. <laughs> this is what I thought I was going to marry into. I said, he's going to be from the UK and he's going to have an accent. Uh, <laughs> I was just like, yeah, he's going to be a doctor. This is what I wanted for my life. I always told my friends, I said, I want a man who's going to give me a Caucasian life. Mm -hmm. Okay. My friend said, oh, I want a man with ashy knuckles. I want a man who looks like he's been to jail, but was redeemed by Christ. I said, that's not what I want. <laughs> I want a man whose pants is at his waist. Okay. Who speaks proper English. <laughs> not too many tattoos. A little bit is okay, but fully tatted and teardrop eyes. No, 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 no. That's, that's not what I want. Loka Caesar with the deep waves. Listen, baby. Okay. <laughs> and the beer that connects so that we can connect. That's that. Listen, it's what you're asking for. Okay. I wanted my man to dress very simply suburban. Okay. That's, that's in me. That's what I wanted. Okay. <laughs> so that's really the bear that connects. Come on now. So that's really what I subconsciously gravitated to. When I saw a man was not a provider, I quickly removed myself from the situation. Cause I'm going to be here. <laughs> I don't have to be here. <laughs> so I wasn't on the dating market long, um, you know, but I really only took the men seriously who, again, were providers. But again, it was a subconscious thing that I was doing. So anyways, I was in DC. The Lord told me to move back to ATL because I was in ATL for a year. But how many of you know, when you move to a new city in the middle of the pandemic, you don't really see the city like it is for real because nobody outside. You know what I'm saying, right? When I first moved to ATL, I loved it. But remember, I moved right in the middle of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now I moved back to ATL when the pandemic had already waned, right? And I tried to do what I was doing in DC. I tried to do it in, in where is it? ATL. And I saw it really cool. I said, oh no, mm -mm -mm. The, the caliber of men is not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. It's not the same. It's not the same. All I need was, hey, little mama twice. And I said, mm -mm, nope, got to change my strategy. Okay. Um, and this comes with a bit of social awareness. And I said, I had to just look around me. I said, hold on, girl. I'm in the hood. I need to sit here and position myself. <laughs> where are the rich people at? Where's that? Alpharetta? Boom. Okay. Where are they at? Ritz Carlton? Boom. Again, I was not really, <laughs> I was, it was not a conscious thing. I just knew I needed to position myself in front of men who could provide, right? Because why would I be entertaining a man who cannot provide, right? That's not the life I wanted to live. Um, so anyways, that's what I just did. And they said, okay, I'm going to go to the Ritz Carlton. I'm going to dress up. I'm going to go to the bar, <laughs> you know, but anyways, I, I got online and, um, I met my husband, my provider husband, Charles, um, on a Christian dating app. Okay. And my husband was quick with it. Hello, somebody. <laughs> we met, we matched. He super liked me, super liked him back. We had a quick conversation. He said, when are you free to go on a date? I said, tomorrow or the weekend during the week, I'm not free. He said, okay, let's go tomorrow. I said, okay. He said, what's your flavor? I said, I like savory and seafood. He said, bet, let's go here. And I said, ooh, how many dollar signs? Three dollar sign, four dollar sign. <laughs> I said, okay, you got money, okay. <laughs> I went, took me on a nice fancy date, first date, okay? First date that he took me on was a nice date, fancy date. And he took me on four dates in the span of one week. Okay, that man was chasing me. I said, wow, I didn't know I could live life like this. <laughs> but it was great, you know, like he was really into me. And I could see that he was the type of man that I wanted to be with. And uh, we dated for six months and he married me in six months. So I went from married um, in six months. Well, I went from single for six years to married in six months. So now I'm currently living in the fruit of my labor. All the things that I have prepared for for six years um, in my singleness is now coming to fruition. Now I get to be a stay-at-home mom. Now I get to work on our family businesses from home. Now I get to be fully provided for 
by a masculine provider husband. So it is, it's great, but that's a little bit about me and my journey um, in hypergamy. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, so Godly Femme Rebrand. Re um, Godly Femme has been a collection of my femininity journey. I started Godly Femme actually as a course. I used to do a lot of courses back in the day. Um, so it started off as just like a master class. And I, when did I start? I started this in 2020. Yes, yes. Because at that time I had started uh, my first ministry, Single on Purpose International, which has now been kind of merged with Godly Femme. I started Single on Purpose International. I was mentoring women. It was cool, but I said, hmm, there is another need that needs to be met that's not fully tied with singleness, right? I said, it has a slightly different tone to it because I really want to teach these women femininity. Now, this is where femininity was starting to get sprinkled in. This is like 2020. Like around 2020 is when femininity was like starting to like buzz. Like people don't really know, but if you knew, you knew. Okay, if you were in the note, you were in the note. But if you weren't, you didn't really catch on until probably like last year. So anyway, so I said, hmm, I want to teach these women um, golly femininity because I already immediately saw what I saw of femininity was simply how to get a man, right? Um, I saw a lot of manipulation. I saw witchcraft, divination. Um, when it came to femininity, and I said, oh, hold on, we... This this is really the same thing of biblical womanhood, right? We're just rebranding it <laughs> into femininity, but it's not like this is a new concept. It's just got to rebrand. So anyways, Godly Femme, what I started doing was a, um, how do I say it? Master classes. And then I started to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. And um, yeah, it was a collection of my femininity journey because I had learned a lot about femininity but here's the thing. I learned how to be a feminine woman in my singleness. Because I always say that it, 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 you shouldn't wait for a man to become feminine. Femininity is what you embody. Being a woman of God is what you embody. You don't sit there and wait until, oh, a man looks at you. Oh, yeah, let me start taking care of myself. No, girl, come on now, right? That's to be who you are. You know, so for me, again, this is what I was pouring into for six years. I'm like, I don't need a man to sit here and tell me to look nice. I don't need I don't need a man to tell me I'm letting myself go. OK, I don't need a man to tell me how to be feminine, how to be a daughter of God. Right. I don't need a man to tell me my identity, my value, my purpose. OK, so th this was something that I already knew. OK, so that's how feminine godly femme had started. Now, here is where we start to get, we start to see something. When I got married, I saw a huge discrepancy between worldly feminine and true biblical womanhood, like I said. And what I also saw was that biblical womanhood, aka golly femininity, seemed like a privileged lifestyle that only white women could achieve. So last year, I mean, I've been married for almost a year now. Yeah, we're going to um, reach our one-year anniversary in two weeks. So whoop, whoop, praise the Lord. <laughs> but for the whole one year I was married, it was like a door of revel a revel revelation opened up to me that was not there before. It's like I had pieces, but once I was married, it was like, it's like, you know, like rain is trickling and then it's like someone pours a bucket on you. That's what it felt like. And I said, I get it now. I see the light. But what really started to grieve me is whenever I would see things about biblical womanhood, there was a certain type of theme. There, there was a, it was a theme that I was seeing. All the women who actually, this stuff is biblical, right? The mindset and the things that they were teaching was biblical. It was in the Bible, the same Bible we're studying, right? These women who are homemakers, who are stay-at-home moms, who are homesteaders, homeschoolers, they were all white. And they had the same getup, the little house on the prairie, right? The long dresses, the cows and the chickens, right? Um, it was all the same and they were all white. And I said, huh. And that really hit me. I'm like, but y'all are hypergamous though. 
but it seemed like this was so gate kept away from my black Christian sisters, right? And my urban sisters, the, the women who live in cities. It seemed like this brand and this flavor of biblical womanhood was only available for white women. And that hurt me because this is an option that we as women have, but we don't think that we're worthy of it, right? As black women, because we have been trained and bred to be um, hyper-masculine, right? To be super independent. We don't need no man. A lot of us come from fatherless homes. So we have to play the mom and the dad, right? We can't trust no man. Our men are not competent in their masculinity. So from where we're coming from, this idea of having a life that you're just having children and you get to stay at home barefoot and pregnant and you get to wear these long, you know, floral dresses and you have some chickens and you have this, you know what I'm saying? Like, it just seemed very unobtainable for most of us. And if we're being very honest, most of us have not even been raised in that type of environment where we prioritize marriage at an early age, where we prioritize the home, right? Where we were taught biblical womanhood. Okay. A lot of us did not come from communities like that. And it grieved me. <laughs> it grieved me. Right. And I said, you know what? We got to push this, but it has to, it has to relate to black women. Right. So as you can see, you know, our little collage over here, I'm like, hypergamy is not just little house on the prairie. That's one image of it. Right. Of Christian hypergamy, but it can also be you know, someone like me, someone like you, why not, right? Why Why do we have to fit into this mold and this very tight-knit box of what it looks like, okay? So I wanted to make hypergamy, Christian hypergamy, biblical womanhood, more accessible um, to Black women because, again, we have not been taught. At least I haven't. I don't know about you. <laughs> I was not taught to be a stay-at-home mom. It was things that I had to be very intentional about learning and growing and developing in, in my own singleness. Yeah. So that is what we have. Now let's talk about hypergamy. Okay. Hypergamy is marriage. Well, this is Merriam-Webster dictionary. Hypergamy is marriage into an equal or higher case or social group. That's the dictionary definition. Christian hypergamy is important for women to have rest, covering, financial protection, and to be homemakers. Um, I guess we can go to that. Um, Titus 2, 3, 5. Let me see. Maybe I should have bookmarked it before I got here, but I did not. Um, hmm. Did I pass it? Jeez. Because I have my husband's. Actually, oh, I can use my phone. Stop playing with me. All right, I know I already opened it. There you go, right there. Okay, so I'm reading um, NIV. Um, this is um, Paul, Apostle Paul, writing a letter to um, Titus. Okay, so it says, Likewise, teach the older woman to be reverent in the way that they live not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will align the word of God. Hallelujah. So when it comes to women in the Bible, You'll see a common theme, and I don't think it's simply just cultural. You will see a theme that men usually took on the financial burden. It did not mean that women did not work. Women did work, which we'll talk about in a second. Their work just looked different from men, right? Usually women were at home, keeping the home, raising the kids, right? And if we read even Proverbs 31, you know, she had her side hustle. She was doing stuff, but the home life was never undone. So this idea of family being the bedrock, right, was, was ingrained, at least in Jewish um, culture. Now, 
when you understand, again, this is not a whole Bible study. <laughs> I'm just trying to give you guys something to think about. When it comes to men, right? The Bible says that husbands are the head of their wives. Okay. The Lord made men to be leaders, leaders of their home. There is a huge implication that comes with it. A lot of men want to lead, but they don't want the responsibility. There comes a responsibility of being the head. That comes with covering your wife, protecting your family, covering your, your wife and your children. That comes with protection, right? That comes with provision because you are the one who started this family. Hello, somebody. It's, it's really, in my opinion, okay, very irresponsible, okay, for a man to not be able to provide, to protect, to lead, to go and marry a woman and say, you go provide for my family that I built. You have my last name. Our kids have my last name. I'm the head of the home. I'm going to sit here like a baby girl with my feet up and you go and provide for me. Hmm? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, hold on now. You, <laughs> you're going to put me and the kids to work while you stay here and put your feet up. <laughs> you know, so it, 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 again, this is my opinion, but it's very irresponsible for a man to start a home, right? That he cannot provide for. If he is the one who is responsible and tasked with um, creating a legacy and creating um, a home life, well, then I am just here to help. Okay. I am a helper. But it's, I can't help you not doing nothing. Okay. I, I'm here to help, but I'm not here to be the source. Okay. So these are, again, things that I've learned from the word of God and from spending time with the Lord, right? That I said, no, men, you know, have a responsibility to cover their family. If a family, and, and this goes into godly masculinity, which we won't talk so much about, but if your family is destitute and start starving and you're just like, well, don't know what we're gonna do. What? Hold on now. <laughs> what are we doing here? What are we actually doing here? And you know, so there's that, but also what I noticed in the word of God. Now, this is not like a very clear thing. Hypergamy is not cut in stone like this is this and this is that. This is just from my own personal re revelation that I'm sharing with you. When women were widowed, right? You see, it's a theme that the word of God does not encourage women to go out and work. If you notice, right? Women are, even in the um, the formation of the church, the church is supposed to take care of widows. Well, well why? You, you know, have you ever thought like, why? Why don't they just go out and work if they're women? Men and women are all the same, right? Why are they required to receive from the church or to go and remarry? Why is that? It's not like they couldn't make money. Proverbs 31, women made money. There's women in the New Testament who are single who are making money and supporting the church. Why were they not encouraged to go out and work and support themselves? Even Jesus at the cross, y'all, this was when I realized that, oh, Joseph had died. This whole time when I first read the Bible, I was like, man, Joseph is a deadbeat. I said, I didn't hear about him at all. After he was, after Jesus was 12, I did not hear from him again, right? In the entire gospel. It wasn't until I was reading when Jesus was at the cross and he said to his mother, Mary, this is now your son. He was speaking to John. John, this is your mother. Mary, this is your son. And it hit me. And I said, well, according to Jewish tradition, the first it was the father. The father has jurisdiction, is tasked to protect their daughters. Right? That's why women didn't really leave home until they were married. Then it was the husband. The husband was tasked to cover and protect the woman, right? If the um, husband died, okay, then she was protected and provided for by her next son. Jesus was the oldest son. So if Jesus is dying on the cross and he got to go, wait, hold on now, and you passing her on, that means that Joseph had already passed away. 
Are you guys following with me? All right, I know it's a little bit of Bible study. I don't know if you guys are falling asleep, All right? Don't fall asleep. It's the word of God. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, so, so Joseph was no longer able to provide for her and protect her. So now it was Jesus, because he's the oldest son. Jesus is dying. Now she has to be under the covering of, what is it called? Uh, of John. When we look at Ruth, Ruth and Naomi, Naomi was supposed to be provided for by, is it Abimelech? No, hey, please. <laughs> the father, the, the, the husband, I know that. Yeah, I think it was Abimelech, please. <laughs> okay, so Naomi was married to, I believe it was Abimelech. Jesus, please, I hope I'm right. <laughs> and her sons was Malone and Kilion. Yes, look at me, come on, Holy Spirit. Come on, Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> Now, the husband died. Okay, next in line should be the, the sons. Both of her sons died. Oh, Limelech. Okay, I was right. I think I pronounced it incorrectly. So now all she has is Ruth. She said, I cannot give you another son. They were widowed. They were widowed. Ruth went to work because she had to, to provide for um, Naomi. But even Naomi had wisdom. She said, I need to find you rest rest Ruth was not at rest hello somebody I need to find you rest a husband that word rest means a husband a home that which you are provided for R Naomi and her wisdom said look this is not sustainable you need to go marry hypergamously and be at rest this is not sustainable I cannot give you another child. I'm too old to get married. I'm not, no one's, ain't nobody gonna marry me. I'm way past my time, right? In the dating market, I'm not looking for marriage. I can't offer a man nothing. My womb is dried up. I can't, I ain't got nothing for you, okay? <laughs> That's really Naomi's, I ain't got nothing for you, but you, you're so young. You should remarry and find rest. Come on, y'all. She said, go and marry hypergamously. We have a Kingsman Redeemer. Go and lie by his feet. Show you're available. Okay? And he married her. She was a widow, a foreigner, a widow. She could have just worked her life and just kept working and working and working. But why would the fact that the fact she was working was because of unusual circumstances. Not because this was the plan and intention for God of for her life. That's why I said this is not written clear out in stone. I'm just trying to give you some understanding of why hypergamy, right, as a young Christian woman is important as we're reading the word of God, right? Again, it's not that you cannot work. I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say you can't work. If you want to work, you can work. However, there is rest. Men and women are not the same, okay? Women have um, estrogen. We have monthly cycles. Men have testosterone that in, that enables them to work harder and more than women. They can do more tasking work. They can handle stress better. And you know, it's true. When you look in the workplace, who is the first to leave? Women. Who is the first to take off for a vacation? Women. Who is it? Who is the first to say, oh, I got something to do. I need to go do my hair. Women. Hello, somebody. Women. It should tell you something. We're not built the same. We are not built the same. We'll be quick to be like, this is too much. We are not built the same. I know we're in this gender neutral fluid society, but we are not the same. And that is okay. That is okay. So let me continue because ah, I've been talking for so long. I didn't even realize. Are you people here? Are you people learning? Are, are we awake? Are we awake? Yes. Nope. Hallelujah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk to you all about is... Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on. Just trying to move this over. I want to talk to you the difference between worldly hypergamy and Christian hypergamy so that you are not bamboozled out in these streets. Okay, someone actually sent me a message right before we um, jumped on this webinar. They're like, yeah, but I talked about why you shouldn't listen to people like the sprinkle sprinkle lady because she's a witch, right? <laughs> um, you should really listen to things like hypergamy and femininity from women who are women of God, right? Unfortunately, we don't have enough women doing what Titus 2 
right? Who are, who are Titus to women, older women who are urging younger women to love their husbands, love their children, to be homemakers. That's, that's the word, homemakers. I know I read NIV, it said busy at home. No, the word is homemakers. Urge the younger women to be homemakers, right? To be um, subject to their husbands, not their sugar daddies. Hello? Not their sugar daddies, to their husbands. So worldly, fem worldly hypergamy, what does worldly hypergamy say? Use men for their money. Men are not like, honestly, these hypergamous and femininity women, worldly people, they're still feminist. They don't like men, okay? They don't like men. If you really listen to some of their doctrine, you really just don't like men, okay? Men are not simply used for money. Men are supposed to be respected as godly providers, as the head of the house, not just used as a means to an end for money, okay? There should be some respect and reverence given to men for that position, right? That responsibility that they have. That shouldn't be exploited. It should be respected. Worldly hypergamy encourages sugaring, concubine, concubinage and sex work, okay? Um, it's not uncommon for, I, and I've listened, y'all, I had to do some market research, all right, <laughs> about hypergamy. And they show you how to be harlots. Okay, they said, oh, do this with a man, kiss him, rub him, do this, but don't give him sex yet. But then and when you do give him sex, make sure you give him sex and he gives you a bag and he, hey, hey, when, when? <laughs> I said, for money, do you know what that is? That's called prostitution, okay? <laughs> sex for gain is, is called prostitution. I don't care how you spin it. You could call it girlfriend. You could call it sugar baby. It is prostitution, Okay. Christian hypergamy, okay, I encourage you ladies to show up on the dating market as a wife, not a sugar baby, not a concubine, not a sex worker. Hello, somebody. You're a wife. God created you to be a wife, not a concubine. You know what a concubine is? A concubine is a woman who had a lower status of a wife. So she wasn't married to the husband, right? But she would have sex with him. Sometimes she would even live with him. That's what it is. If you're do if you're if you're doing everything a wife would do without the title of a wife, you're a concubine. Okay, so you can call yourself a girlfriend. A girlfriend is a concubine. Okay, if you're having sex and you're doing, you know, you're living with him and you're doing everything that a wife should do, that is what a concubine is. You are a wife. Hello, in worldly hypergamy, marriage is optional but not necessary, pushed or promoted. Marriage is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is money. Okay, in worldly hypergamy, how to get money from men. In, in Christian hypergamy, the, the goal is marriage. Okay, the goal is marriage to be covered and provided for, not by a boyfriend, not by old sugar daddy, okay, but by a husband, a God-fearing husband, a masculine husband, okay, Femininity, like I said, is used to manipulate men for gain. And worldly hypergamy, femininity is embodied and used for relationship harmony. Okay. So even in uh, my husband and I, we have a, a business, Win at Love, and we have clients that we coach to be in the date to marry market. Femininity, like that's a new thing for a lot of these women to learn, but it's not used as manipulation. It's just, you need to understand how men think, okay? Something I've learned, y'all, a man is a man by any other name. Oh, somebody. I don't care if he in the world. I don't care if he in the church. I don't care if he's tall, black, white, white, short, whatever. <laughs> a man is a man by any other name. Showing up in such a way that creates relationship harmony will help you um, when it comes to, you know, navigating dating, relationships, and marriage. Okay. Worldly hypergamy is fast money. Christian hypergamy, lifetime provision through marriage. Okay. And the last thing, worldly hypergamy, the end goal is a life of complete leisure and free from work. Christian hypergamy is work is channeled through gender related activities. Let me make it very clear for you. Christian hypergamy is not about a life of leisure. Okay, let's go into the word of God. Let's go to Proverbs 31. I'm going to read you guys one verse and then we're going to move on. Are you guys sleeping? Are you guys here? 
Are we still here? We're here. We're here. Yeah. Yes, we're here. Taking notes. <laughs> Taking notes. Okay, awesome. Let's go to Proverbs 31, ladies. Um, Proverbs 31. Um, the, the epilogue of a um, noble wife. Or a wife of a noble character, rather. Um, which one was it? Okay, here we go. So, some of you guys know who are in the email newsletter that I have been um, doing a in-depth Bible study when it comes to Proverbs 31. I want to show you guys something. Proverbs 31, 13. Okay, I'm going to read NASB. Okay, it says she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. So I did a whole breakdown of the Hebrew everything, but when I first read it the first time, I didn't really get much from it. I said, okay, what's she doing? She's just making clothes. I don't really have a deep revelation. But the word says that she looks for wool and flax. And what does she do with it? She works with delight. That means she is not lazy. She looks and seeks work to do. Now, let's not get it twisted. Proverbs 31 woman had monties. She had money. Oh, well, she had money. Dinero. Green. Hmm? How do I know this? It says that she was dressed in purple and linen. Purple was expensive back then. Her kids were dressed in scarlet. She had handmaidens. She had um, workers. They could have done this for her. Hello? Even though she had money, she put her herself to good use. She used her intelligence. She used her resources. She used what was available to her. Okay, so don't think that, oh, hypergamy is just having a man that pays all your bills and you don't do anything because soft girl. No. You just have the flexibility to not work the same way as a man does, but that doesn't mean that you don't work, right? That doesn't mean that you're not a good steward of your home and of your family. And even the money that your husband is giving you, do you just eat it? When your husband is bringing home money, are you creating a budget? right? Saying, hey, we need money here and here. Are you proactive, right? As a woman, are you saying, hey, we need to invest in this or do you just take it and are you selfish and eat it for yourself? I'm not saying you have to work hard like a man, okay? I'm not saying that because if your husband sits here and buys you, me, we, we got, um, what's it called? An iRobot vacuum for our wedding day gift. Ah, I don't have to sweep anymore. I just say, hmm. I go on an app bling, <laughs> and, 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 the, and the little robot is, is sweeping the floor and sucking up all the stuff. I don't have to do anything. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that you have to just work hard unnecessarily. Right. I'm just saying, are you a good steward? When the man gives you money, what do you do with it? Do you eat it? Do you invest it into your home? Do you invest it into your children? Right. Do you find resourceful things to do with what you have? And if you don't have it, what do you do? Do you just let it go? Um, just let it go undone. Okay, you don't have a maid. Clean. Pick up a broom, right? Okay, you don't have somebody to sit here and, and put food inside of your mouth. Okay, what are you going to do? Your children need clothes. You don't have a personal shopper. Are you going to just sit there? The Proverbs 31 woman sought for work to do, but work that was befitting for her as a woman. Hello? Hello. Okay. All right. So let's get into some more juicy stuff. Okay. Let me see some reactions though. How are you guys enjoying this webinar so far? Where's everybody? Put in the chat. Okay. It's so good. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> praise the Lord. Oh, this is new for you. Okay. Well, praise the Lord. Awesome, awesome. Okay, cool. So let's talk a little bit about provider men, all right? This is going to be the heart of hypergamy, is marrying a man um, 
Yeah, so we will have a Q&A at the end. So hold your questions. You're going to send them all to um, Ariel. Okay, Ariel is going to read them. I'm going to answer them at the end. So I'm trying to like, I don't think I have so many more slides. I think I'm almost done actually. Okay, so provider men. Provider men are the gateway to hypergamy. Okay, now it's very important for you to understand provider does not equal rich. Hello, <laughs> don't make that mistake. A man can make a million dollars and still say you have to go and work a career that will not let you stay at home. A man could be making enough money to feed 10 people, 10 mounts. It does not mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Okay. So you have to understand provider doesn't equal rich. Okay. However, I do believe many, many men deep down, right, would provide if they believe they could. Okay. A lot of men don't feel competent in their role of provision. Why? Because this generation of women, for one reason or another, um, they just want everything, especially now we have social media. I want this. I want that. I want this. I want that. And then to even plan a wedding, right? A lot of women pressure men to have a very fancy um, engagement, right? To pay for a wedding. That's a hot $30,000. If a man only making 60000 per annual, right? <laughs> you know, he's going to feel pressured and put off marriage. However, however, if he had a woman who was a bit more savvy when it comes to money and had a, a different set of priorities, men will probably marry sooner and provide if they believe they could. Okay. But a lot of men, what holds them back, it's not that they don't want to. A lot of men deep down, the, the masculinity is, is not a blaze, but it's, it's, a, it's a small flame. Okay. For some men, it's a small flame. It's there, but they don't feel fully competent or encouraged, right, to provide for women. There, There's also things that cause men to provide for you, but we're not going to get to that right now. <clears throat> so another thing that you should know, and, and before I continue, I just want you to know that this is not a dating webinar. Like I said, if you want to know more about dating and how to meet, date, and marry high-quality Christian men, then definitely do follow us um, at Win at Love. Okay, when like the Win Hotel at Love on Instagram, Facebook, everywhere. Okay, um, and you guys can hit us up, you know, and we'll tell you about our program if you do want to actually date and want more practical tools. But anyways, it's really important to know that providers are usually traditional. Take some notes. Okay, yes, one of the um, directors will put it in the chat when I love. But providers are usually traditional, okay? Men who are more liberal, they're usually a bit more effeminate. They're usually a bit more fluid in their identity. They are okay with feminism and, okay, yeah, we're all equal and you do this. And, you know, uh, men who are more liberal usually are lean more towards 50-50, okay? Um, they're more like, hey, I expect you to provide half for the home, even if they, again, if they have it or to just pay your own bills, okay? Usually men who are more liberal, they too are undercover feminists as well, right? <laughs> they they love that stuff. They're the ones who will sit here and be in a relationship for 10 years and they're not really, you know, they're, they're not really providers. They don't understand the importance of legacy and family, okay? So just understand. Now, a lot of providers are usually middle to upper class, this is very important to understand because insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, okay? So provider men usually are middle to upper class. Unfortunately, men from low-income neighborhoods usually do not end up being providers. Why? Because they don't have the money, okay? They cannot actually provide and support a family. So it's not uncommon for a man who is low-income to literally be okay with their wives being the breadwinner. They're okay. Hobosexuals, that's what we call them, okay? The hobosexuals. They fall in love with anyone who got who give them a, a home to live in. They're okay in their baby girl lifestyle. They're okay putting their feet up. They have no ambition. They don't feel anything within them. 
in their masculinity to be like, I am looking at my wife or not even wife, <laughs> not even wife, my girl, she's working two to three jobs to support both of us. Maybe I should get my lazy behind up, okay, and go to work and advance in my career so that I can provide more rest for her. Okay, so men of low income um, class usually are not providers. Not saying that you can't find them there, but if you are in a low income area, right? If you're in a, if you're a low income, and you're dating men who are low income, you might find keep finding yourself in the same situation. Um, it, it will probably benefit you as a woman if you are low income or you come from low income or you live in low income to social climb to at least middle class, right? Because even low, um, low income areas, they don't marry on a high rate, okay? The quality of men in low income area is, again, it's hard, right? Like it, it's hard to find that. Um, so you will have to be a bit more strategic in where you plant yourself, where you position yourself and the type of men you position yourself around. You might want to at least start with middle class, okay? And if, again, if you did not come from a middle class background, you want to do the work to level up, to um, be, and how do I say, accustom yourself with middle class values, okay? But people in low class, they don't really um, value marriage, okay? Why? Because they can't afford it. So you're going to see these women who are concubines having sex, but marriage is not really, at least in the United States, maybe in other countries, it might be different, but men who are from low income areas or have low income usually will be slow to marry and probably slow or even will not provide for their wives. They will expect 50, 50, you pay your bills. Everything is equal. Okay. So provider men usually come from nuclear families. Again, nuclear families where you have a mom and a dad, this is a middle-class value, okay? It's a middle-class value. I'm not saying if you didn't come from a middle, I mean, from a nuclear home, then you can't live hypergamously because it has nothing to do with you really, right? But they usually come from nuclear families because when a man is raised by a single mother, all right? What's, what, ends, what ends up happening with that man is one of two things. Either A, he is going to think that it is okay for a woman to provide for herself because why he saw his own mother provide for herself. There are men who get online, who brag, I saw my mom working five jobs and you know she still kept us going and this and that. And yeah, I really admire my mom. She was so strong. And you think that's a flex. Hey, that one is a flex. Your mom worked three jobs because she had to. She didn't have a husband. And you are now going to expect that same level of tenacity from the woman that you choose to be with, right? So if a, a man grew up and he saw his mom struggle and he thinks that's normal, he more than likely will end up being a 50-50 man. And then the second issue with that is because he, did, he was not raised with a father, an active and a present father in the home, he has no image for what masculinity and godly manhood looks like, okay? He doesn't understand that, oh, I have a responsibility to be the head. I have the responsibility to provide. Like I have to cover my family. He will not quickly get that incentive unless if he, you know, was raised in the church, was raised by other godly men. It, he might not really have that in his mind. And then the last thing is, you know, men who are raised from single mother households, it's not uncommon for um, the single mother to use the son as a surrogate spouse. Right. So the mom will not really allow the son to leave and cleave because she, he was the only source of masculinity in the home and sometimes provision. She will sabotage, right, her husband marrying a woman because she was she gonna feel a type of way, like, why are you buying nice stuff for her? Why are you providing for her? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What about me? I don't have nobody. I'm first, I'm your mom, right? So the mom will sometimes kind of come in there and try to like, you know, you know, you, you know what I'm saying, trying to meddle and, you know, oh, I don't like her because she's the, you know, just, just little stuff. Like I hear, I hear too many stories, <laughs> too many stories. So um, 
really, where are they? They're all around. You just have to be strategic. But if you have these like things in your mind, when it comes to hypergamy, like they're usually traditional, usually middle to upper class, and they usually come from nuclear homes, it's kind of easy to weed them out. And I'm not saying that there is not exceptions to the rules, but exceptions to the rules make the rule. Okay. My husband is a provider. But let me tell you something. My husband came from a two-parent household. Okay. He lived with his father and his stepmother was a stay-at-home mom for the majority of his life. Okay. She was a stay-at-home mom. He grew up wanting to be just like his dad. His dad was present in the home. He was a family man. He provided. He had a, a symbol of, hey, I want to be like my dad. So that's why he doesn't have any problem providing. That's not new to him. That's expected of him. Okay. But again, he falls into like he was raised middle class, nuclear home, and he's a traditional man. Okay. So just keep that in mind as you're dating because don't sit here and try to take a bum and try to turn them into a provider. It doesn't work. Hello. It doesn't work. It's better that you just position yourself in front of men who are already providers. Okay. But where are they? They're all around you. There's a lot of men on the dating market right now today that will want to get married in traditional. I know some men who literally have bought homes simply because I, when I get married, I want my wife to have a place to come live and rest. There are men who've already bought homes. My husband sat there and he saved up 85 K right. Disciplined himself financially simply because he knew, Hey, I want my wife and my kids to be set. I don't want them to come into poverty. There are men who are preparing, just like how I was preparing to keep the home. There are men out there who are preparing in their traditional roles of being providers. All right. Awesome. Dang, I've been talking for a lot. I thought this was going to be like one hour chat. <laughs> okay, I think this is the last one before we move into Q&As. Where are we at? We good? You know, is this too long? Y'all like, dang, hurry up. Is it the good stuff? I'm said no. Okay, though. Not at all. Praise the Lord. Loving it. Very thorough. Praise God. Okay, okay. So this is the last thing I'm going to leave you with. Okay. How to prepare to live high pergamously. So let's say you're on the fence, but now I kind of convince you like, yo, I want to live high pergamously. Okay. How do I do that? How do I prepare? Okay. First, you have to decide. I had decided in my mid twenties, I want to be a stay at home mom. I didn't think it was impossible. I didn't think, oh, well, I'm African. So I have to go and, you know, be a lawyer, doctor, engineer, or disgrace the family. I'm ready engineer. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be a stay at home mom. <laughs> Glory to God. I didn't have any debt, right? I have any student loan debt, but still, I, I didn't want to go and chase career and more debt. <laughs> um, but I decided I'm going to be a stay at home mom. That's what I wanted. That was the desire of my heart. Okay. So you have to decide what type of life do you want to live for yourself? Okay. Like I said, it, you don't necessarily have to go straight stay at home mom route. Okay. If you can find a career that can give you the flexibility, right. To put the home first. Okay. That your marriage isn't lacking. Your children isn't lacking. Your home isn't lacking. Right. Maybe you're going to have a, I don't know, maybe you have money and you're going to have a maid, a house cleaner come in every week. I don't know. Maybe you have it like that. I love it for you. Okay. <laughs> like, I love it for you. Maybe you're going to do me. I what, what did I do? I was doing um, Amazon Fresh for a little bit. I would just order it on my phone. And then after when we leave church, we just pick it up and that's it. I didn't even have to go inside of a grocery store, um, grocery store anymore. <laughs> it's just now that I'm doing it because I'm a stay at home wife. So I'm like, okay, I have a little bit more time. So I like to actually go out and look through the aisles and shop and be a bit more creative, but I didn't have to do that. Okay. <laughs> so again, if you have it like that, sure. But if your career is super stressful and it's going to cause you to neglect the home, you know, pray about it. I'm not telling you to not have a career. I'm not telling you to not have a job. I'm not telling you to just sit here and just sit on your hands. Okay. I'm not saying that. I think women are intelligent. We're smart. We're doing a lot of great things in life. It's just more about priorities. 
something I tell women too, it's like, hey, you know, a career is always going to be there, right? If you really have this desire in your heart, sometimes it might be more wise to um, settle your home first and then go back to school or to continue your career. That's what I will do, right? Like I want to do a doctorate of psychology, but that is, <laughs> I don't, it's not, it's, it, it, it's not by force, okay? <laughs> like it is really not by force. I would rather sit here, have all my kids. And unfortunately I'm starting late in life. Well, it's not late. I'm 29, turning 30 this year, but my husband wants four to 10 kids, Jesus. <laughs> and I said, listen, I'm not going to be really that deep into geriatric pregnancy, having all these kids. Okay. So if I'm going to be having kids relatively close in age, okay because I didn't get married in my mid twenties that I really wanted to, but I didn't have the knowledge and the resources to be able to do it. Okay. It might not make sense for me to add a doctorate on top of that. Okay. It just might not. I'm glad that instead of focusing on trying to get into school, I just focused on getting married. <laughs> That's where I put my focus on. Now I'm married. Okay. Now we can, you know, build our family. Once my kids are grown, I could go back to school. Is the university running away from me? It's not running, <laughs> you know, but again, it's just more of, you have to know for yourself where you're at and what you're trying to do. And even if you are in school, okay, am I also going to date hypergamously, right? Is this something that I can do right now? Can I multitask, right? So again, I'm not saying drop out of school, please. Don't let them come and collect me. <laughs> so yeah, tell a woman not to go to school. I didn't say not, don't go to school. If you already are in school or if you're already preparing to go to school, you can go to school, right? I'm just saying, get your MRS degree. This is what the white women have been doing. They've just been gate kept. These white women are going to school. MRS degree is called ring before spring, okay? They go to school to get married. That's all, that's that's why they're in school. Pata, pata, that's it. They go they go walk with their little pencil skirt down to the STEM building, okay? To the STEM department. Hey, hey, hey. And they get a ring before spring. The end. <laughs> That's what they do. So if you're in school, don't be a, don't be a, a, a bubble. Like, don't be a fool. Take yourself to the PhD department. Take yourself to where they're doing pre-med, pre-law, okay? <laughs> where they're doing, where they're doing something. Go to STEM, Okay. Go to uh, these these places. Don't do psychology unless if he wants to go to do post grad. Please, psychology department. Don't go there. But go to the places. Okay, it uh -huh. it. Go there. Okay, <laughs> go there. Go talk to the men in it. Go talk to the men in STEM. Go talk to the men in engineering. Go talk to the men in the PhD programs. Go talk to the men who are doing a graduate degree. Okay, this is the people you need to get to know and you need to surround yourself with. Okay, not the people we're doing and. and um, sociology and psychology, and that's it, who are not even going to go get their master's, at least go be a therapist, okay, so position yourself, okay, while you're in school, yes, get your degree, do well, but also you have to have this as a priority as well, especially when you're in your prime, okay, so the next thing is have a vision, like I said, you need to have a vision for your life, and the type of lifestyle that you want to live, okay, so what type of mom do you want to be, what type of wife do you want to be? What type of home do you want to be? Um, do you want to have, rather? Okay. Think about these things. Like, I thought about these things in my 20s. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to do maybe a family vacation. I want to have traditions. And we could do this. And we could do that. And I want my home to be like this. And I want us to have gay nights. I want us to have a family day. I want us to have date nights every week. Listen, I thought about this, so I thought about this, okay, before I even got married. This is what I spent my time doing just planning. I said, okay, well, I said, okay, what kind of foods would they eat? I want them to be cultured. Um, just different things like that. All right. Next is cultivate a wife mindset. This is super important. Okay. You want to cultivate, you, you want to position yourself as a wife. Okay. As a wife, not a concubine. You're not a girlfriend. I used to always say that I am not a hundred guys' girlfriend. I am one man's wife. Hello. One man's wife. When I was in the dating market, I said, girlfriend, girlfriend, Kini, what is that one? <laughs> I said, I don't know what girlfriend is. <laughs> if you want me to be your girlfriend, mm, that's fine. But I'm not your wife until I have a ring. Even when I was dating my husband, I kind of knew, knew that we'd probably get married. But until 
you actually marry me, I would say like, yeah, I want to do this with my husband one day. As if, if, if it's you, if it's not you, I don't know. <laughs> this is what I was telling to him. I said, yeah, I want to save this for my husband. And he's like, well, I am going to be your husband. Gonna is not the same as is. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Gonna is not the same as is. Okay. Until I see a ring, I don't know who you are. <laughs> Me, we're just playing patty cake. You're just Brother Charles right now until we get married. Hello. Okay. But that's how I moved in the dating market. I mean, I was still there. I was positioned, but I made sure I knew. I said, look, until I get a ring, I don't know. We're just friends. <laughs> we're just friends. Okay. But have a wife mindset. You want to cultivate a wife mindset? How did I do that? Really, it was just identity in Christ. reading, studying the word, um, just understanding who I was as a woman of God, okay? Next is learn domest domestication skills, cleaning and cooking, okay? Learn that. You cannot guarantee that you will, your husband will be able to afford a chef and a butler and a maid, okay? Every day and they'll be living with you. Unless if you live in Nigeria, maybe, right? <laughs> maybe, some of you guys maybe live in Nigeria and you know, labor is cheap in Nigeria. So perhaps- However, us in the United States and abroad, okay, it, that, that might not be <laughs> as feasible. You, you know, you may not marry a man who's going to sit here and hire, uh, what's it called, a, a cook. So it's just good to know regardless, know it for yourself, okay? Know how to cook meals on your own. Know how to cook for a family on your own. Learn about nutrition. Hello. Okay, that's really going to be more of your thing. Make sure you're not killing your husband. with diabetes <laughs> and high blood pressure, okay? And make sure you just understand some basics of nutrition because you, yes, you, you will have um, access to this recording. You'll have a, a playback. Yes, you will, okay? I know, I, I really said one hour. <laughs> Emma, you know, <laughs> it's like I was trying to keep this condensed, but then I started talking. I was getting into it and I said, oh man, I've been talking for a while, but it's okay. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, okay, so yes, learn domestication skills. All right. We learn so much for our degrees. Do we not? We will study. How many textbooks have you read hmm? in school? Pick up one book, just one. Okay. When it comes to cooking. Okay. When it comes to cleaning, when it comes to organization. All right. Uh, next thing is step up, level up your feminine allure. This is very important, especially as a hypergamous wife. Um, you're going to be a stay-at-home mom, please. you are really going to be the only woman that this man is seeing, truly, okay? You need to still dress for the job, okay? You go to work, right? Go out to dress up for another man, for your, for your boss, right? But you won't dress up at home to be an example for your children and even for yourself, right? You're dressing bummy at home. You're, you're dressing, you're, you have holes inside of your underwear, You just, you have your helmet of salvation on every day. You don't put your hair down, right? Just even some simple makeup at home. Something small, lip gloss, your lips are chapped at home. Your legs is ashy at home. At home, uh-uh. But yes, if it's time for, for Pati, oh, then you will go and, and, and put yourself together so nicely for everybody else. You will smell nice for everybody else, but not for your husband. Come on, what's going on here? What is going on here? Don't let yourself go, ladies. This has to be something you embody for yourself. This is something I learned in godly femininity before I met my husband. My husband did not have to worry. When I get up in the morning, right? I get up, I take a shower and I put on real clothes. I don't even wear jeans, really. I mean, this is just me. Jeans are just too casual for me. I wear trousers or I wear a dress, even when I'm at home. Why? Because I take my job seriously. This is a job, okay? <laughs> Being a stay-at-home mom, Being a homemaker is a job. Dress for the job. Your kids are watching you. You have to, because when you dress well, you'll be more productive in the things that you're doing. Keep, your, keep yourself maintained as a woman. Do your toenails, right? Brush your teeth. Don't take your husband for granted and start getting comfortable, right? Even your weight. Keep a healthy weight, a healthy BMI, okay? Watch what you eat. Make sure that you're healthy, you know, still exercise. Even when you're a stay-at-home mom, find the time to exercise, okay? But make sure that you develop these habits even before you marry hypergamously, okay? Next is learn home management skills. So like I said, learn things like budgeting, learn things like organization, 
Hello, organization. Are you organized or is your house a mess? Is your room a mess? Look around your room right now. How is it looking? Okay. <laughs> is this a place like if, if you were to go now and to live in your dream home, would you take anything in your room there? Would you take the same habits? Hmm? Would you take it? Look in your closet right now. How does it look? Does it look a, does it look a mess? Open your drawers right now. Is it a mess? Hmm? Look in your tub. Is it dirty? Right? Is it dirty? Are you always leaving cups and plates everywhere in your room? Is it dirty? Do you make your bed in the morning? Okay. So think about these things. Um, next is learn about parenting and child rearing. Again, you pick up with so many books. Pick up a book when it comes to um, parenting. Okay. Don't make an excuse of, oh, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. Sure, there's no such thing, but there's books to prepare you. Okay, listen, let, let's not be lazy here. You know, I just learned about Montessori and one of the directors and I were having such a blast talking about, I said, I had no idea. I had no idea. I said, I could not believe, it. I thought this was just a trend. I had no idea there was a method to this madness. When you see these little kids and they have small refrigerators and they're cooking for themselves at two years old, I said, I haven't. I just thought that that was just a random thing. I had no idea there was a method to the madness. Me, I've been learning about Montessori, right? And I said, wow, I did not know that kids could be cooking at two years old. Huh? Look at them sitting there. They have their small little um, table. And they sit there. They roll out of bed. They have their whole morning routine at two years old. Two. These kids have morning and nighttime routine by themselves. You don't even touch them. They could go and make their own food. They go to their mini fridge. And they sit there and they make their sandwiches and they pour their juice and they sit down at their little table. I said, wow, I had no idea. Guys, I had, again, this stuff was gate kept for me. <laughs> it is gate kept. But yeah, learn about stuff like that. Okay. And the last thing is to level up your social capital. Like I said, usually men who are of higher, uh, how do I say, quality in the dating market, they usually are middle, upper class, like get cultured, okay? Don't don't be so in a box, get cultured, okay? Learn about different things, learn a new language, you know? Um, put yourself around different types of people, learn some current events, step up your social capital, go to the museum, okay? <laughs> put yourself around different people and put yourself in the environment of the lifestyle that you wanna live, okay? Hallelujah! Hallelujah. I know I fucked the lots. Okay, so giveaway. Um, and then we'll close out. So we're gonna close out probably in the next 10, 15 minutes. So don't sleep. I know I was talking a lot, but we're here. We're still going. <laughs> okay, so the giveaway will be Pelumi. Hi ladies, good evening. I'm sure you've enjoyed this webinar. We've received so many gems of wisdom I hope you took notes and most importantly I hope you are ready to apply this now if you are not a part of our Facebook group already please do join our Facebook group um, it is called Black Hypergamous Christian Women one of the other directors will post a link in the chat but this all links to our giveaway now if you invite three friends we will be giving you access, free access to one of Godly Femme's courses called Basic to Baddy, which is all about how you present yourself. So if you join the chat um, Facebook group, first of all, and then invite three friends, you'll be given a discount code to the Basic to Baddy course. So we'll be sending this link out to you and also within the chat. Um, and your friends have to answer the membership question to enter and to be accepted into this group chat. This is a private Facebook group for fellow Black hypergamous Christian women. Hope that makes sense. And now I'm going to hand over to Ariel for question and answer. Ooh, thank you. Okay. Oh, hold on. Um, there we go. Hey everyone, um, I'm just trying to drop the Facebook link in the chat. Um, just give me a minute. It is, my laptop is being slow right now, but 
yeah, if you have any questions, please send them to me privately and I will read them aloud for Jumi to answer. So oh, thank you, Plumi, so much. All right, so there is a link for the Facebook group in the chat. Um, but yeah, all your questions, please send my way and we'll get started. You enjoy this, Ariel? Sorry, what? I said you enjoyed this webinar, Ariel? Um, yes, I enjoyed it very much. I have my notes right, Tara. It was great. All right, so our first question says, how do you show up as a wife? Okay, so showing up as a wife has all to do with mentality. It has all to do with identity. Um, you can't fake being a wife. And that's what some women try to do, right? They get on the dating market. They show up as a girlfriend. They show up as a hookup, right? They show up as a, a good time, but not a long time. And then when their efforts don't work, then they try to manipulate and guilt a man to being with them, to committing to them, to marrying them. That's not what wives do, okay? Wives understand their value, their identity, and who they are as a daughter of God, okay? That they were created to be a wife, okay? A wife, okay? And they don't sit around with men who are not their husbands, okay? So if a man is showing you, hey, I am not a husband, okay? And I'm not going to marry. I'm not ready for marriage. I just want sex. I just want whatever, then you know what a wife does? A wife doesn't sit there and try to manipulate and force him to be with her and say, oh, I can change him, right? You know what a, man, a, a wife does? Move aside. <laughs> Move aside so that her husband can find her. Wives do not take themselves off the dating market for an extended period of time with one man. They don't toil and play patty cake with a man for years. That's what concubines do, okay? Because really that's only possible if you're having sex. Wives don't sit here and get with men who are not ready for marriage, all right? They don't sit here and spend three, five, six, nine years in a relationship waiting for a ring. They don't do that, okay? They don't make themselves unavailable. Like, wives are not going to commit themselves because that's a commitment. When you take yourself off the dating market indefinitely, you are committing yourself to this one man. And if he has not made that ultimate commitment to you, why are you committing to him and you're not his wife? You're not his wife. If I'm not your wife, that's okay. I'll go and find my husband. You go and find your wife. Godspeed. Okay. So that's really showing up as a wife. That's what it is. When I met my husband, I wasn't afraid. Look, he was great. My husband is a, that's a good man. But he, neither of us were afraid to leave this situation if it was not benefiting us. We were not afraid to walk away. I don't care how much money he was making. I said, listen, next time it's going to be a millionaire because I said, I'm going to just keep rising up. I said, you're making what, multiple six figures? I said, okay, well, the next one, okay, half a mil. <laughs> listen, I was not, I, I knew, you know, how to play this game, per se, in the date to marry marketplace. And I just kept getting better at it and weeding and vetting men. So by the time I met my husband, I wasn't like, oh my gosh, it's the only man ever. Oh, I didn't operate out of desperation. I wasn't afraid to walk away. I had a date set on my calendar that I circled. And I said, if he does not move things forward by this time, God, I'm leaving. I'm going to text him. Hey, Brother Charles, thank you so much for your time. Block, 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 <laughs> block. That's it. I was going to move on with my life. The end. <laughs> so that's what I mean by operating as a wife. I wasn't going to sit there. Mm -mm. A man doesn't need more than six months to know if he's going to marry you or not. If you're his dream girl, or you're his placeholder. Why am I going to be there for more than six months and he has not mentioned a future with me and, or he's not ready? Like, what are we talking about here? <laughs> so my husband had a choice to make. He's like, okay, either <laughs> I marry or I let my dream girl go. He only had two options. That's it. Because he knew I was not about the games. Okay, He knew. So he had a decision as a man to make for himself this is the woman that I want to be with. She has everything I'm looking for. She is a wife. She is God-fearing. She is beautiful. Everything I wanted a woman, I have it right here. I could take this jump, this leap of faith, and marry her, 
Or I can let her leave and go back to the streets because there's none there for me. Listen, let me tell you something. Ain't none out there in the streets besides Casamigo and Suffering. I'm going to tell you. Okay? Ain't nothing out there in the streets besides Casamigos and Suffering. Okay? <laughs> Once you get the best, you not, what you, where are you going to go? What you, what you going to do? <laughs> you, you, you going you to meet another wife on the dating market? In this economy? Okay. <laughs> Anyways, continue. <laughs> um, to add on to that question, she writes, what are some of the best ways to position yourself? Joy, um, follow when I love. Okay. We talk a lot more about positioning. Okay. And practical things to position. So like I said, really, you have to, the, the, the biggest thing I could tell you for positioning, you have to know for yourself what you want. I knew what I want. Like I said, I wanted a man who was suburban. And who was going to give me a Caucasian life. My friends wanted men who had ashy knuckles and looked like they'd been to jail, but they'd been redeemed. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's great. Me, I knew what I wanted. And I only entertained men who fit a certain vision that I wanted and, and was, was going to have a certain lifestyle that I was looking for. Right? So that's, I mean, once you get very specific on the type of man that you want, and I knew this man was probably traditional, so I dressed more traditionally right? Wore dresses when I went out. I look nice when I went out. I wore my hair long. Like really get into the mind of the type of man that you want to be with and then position yourself in places that he would be at. Yeah. Love it. Um, okay, we got a lot of questions. The next one is, apart from reading the word, any other practical things I can do to cultivate a wife mindset? It has to be identity. Like you, you have to spend time with the Lord. And I know it seems kind of like, oh, but I want more. But it's like you're only because it's really a a thing of one knowledge, and knowledge comes from the Word. the The world is not going to tell you to be a wife. They're not going to give you that truth. You need to know the truth for yourself, and that comes from what's my husband's Bible. But it comes from the Word, study of the Word. Okay, it comes from a strong identity. And spending time with God. For me, I'm very big on daughtership. I knew I was a daughter. When I met my husband, I told him, hmm? I said, look, I am not leaving my father's house and going to the ghetto. I'm not doing it. My father, my heavenly father, who's the ultimate masculine. My husband has set, not my husband, my father, my heavenly father has set such a high standard for what I expected a man. And you think I am going to leave his house and go to the ghetto. I'm not going. I'm not going. <laughs> you have to go through my father to get to me. Hmm? So again, I mean, that's really the best thing I can tell you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I 100% agree. And then we have, what should stay-at-home moms that are very overworked and tired do between cooking, cleaning, and taking care of children with little to no support? Um, if you're tired, I think everything really boils down to priorities, right? So the Proverbs 31 woman, she outsourced. She, it's not about doing, to have it all, you don't have to do it all. Okay. To have it all, you don't have to do it all. So if something is stressing you, either A, outsource or B, is this really a priority, right? There's some things that's like, okay, the house is not as clean as I want it to be but I'm playing with my kids. It can wait, right? Or, you know, I want to, you know, cook these five course meals every single day, but you know what? It's really taking so much time away from my husband. Maybe I need to make more simple meals, right? Maybe we need to eat leftovers. Maybe we need to even order takeout from time to time so that I can still be present in my family. You know, and I would say, again, just talk to your husband about these things, right? But, you know, you, again, this is why you need to study Proverbs 31. You have to look and invest and say, okay, where can we put money into to alleviate this? I told y'all how for um, um, our wedding, 
on our registry. See, my husband was like, oh, we don't need a registry because we have a small condo. We should just ask for money. I said, uh-uh. I'm asked for stuff. I asked for a small little vacuum, okay? Automatic vacuum. I don't vacuum. <laughs> you know, I would have asked too for a mop, you know, but I asked for gadgets that was going to make my life easier. You know, I think like that. I'm like, okay, how can I plan better when it comes to mealtime and this and that? You know, you have to just be a bit more strategic, but you don't have to do it all. Outsource. If you got to eat out once a week, you will not die, right? <laughs> you will not die. But where can you invest your husband's money, right? So that it alleviates your own burdens. And then you mentioned, I'm sorry, what? How many more questions? Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, okay. well, let me start over. Uh, start over? Hey. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't think we're going to be able to answer all of them. Might have to put it inside of a Facebook group so that we can have more conversation about it. But how many questions? Counted about six. Hmm. Rapid fire round three. <laughs> What's the three <laughs> juicy points? Okay. We're going to put inside of the Facebook group. So make sure that you guys do join the Facebook group if your question was answered. Awesome. So there's one you mentioned about taking life as it comes. How do I come out of this mindset? Oh, I said that? Wait, wait what did I said that in reference to? <laughs> oh, 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 the being a passive in your own life. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that you come out of that is creating a vision, being intentional, the end. You know, you don't just accept life as it comes because that's mediocrity. And then you complain, oh, I didn't get this. Well, you didn't ask for it. Okay. So you need to just be honest with yourself. What do you desire? And don't limit God. You cannot have a scarcity mindset. You can't be afraid. Oh, I think it's too big. Okay, well, then it's too big. Then stay small and don't complain, right? But if you truly in your heart want something, nobody's going to come. There's no tooth fairy or Santa Claus that's going to come and give it to you. For me, I had a vision and I worked towards it six years. Well, let me not say six years. It was more, well, I guess it was six years. <laughs> like, I'm trying to, let's say four. Let's be generous. Let's just say four. But for four years, I worked at it. Four years. I had a vision for my life. I agreed with the vision. And I did intentional things to prepare me for a little by little consistency. And I aligned myself to where I said I was going. If I said I want to be a stay-at-home mom, well, what did I do? I aligned myself to it. Nobody who sits here and says, I want to be a doctor, wakes up one day and becomes a doctor. They had to decide it. They decide it and they walk the journey to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. And then second, how long is a reasonable amount of time to be committed to a boyfriend? Mm -hmm. it, I, I, that has everything to do with your own worth as a woman. I can't tell you. I can't tell you. There's a saying that says a woman will only leave the table when she's full and not a minute sooner. Okay. So until you, what is your risk management strategy? Every woman is different. Okay. For me, I wasn't going to sit here and play patty cake with a man for more than six months. And he not mentioned marriage, right? He's not moving it forward and he's still undecided. I'm gone, right? I am gone. A man doesn't, and six months is really like the max. That's for the stragglers. So you have to decide for yourself, hey, how long am I going to stay in this relationship? Because again, a relationship only means you guys are dating exclusively, but there needs to be an end to it, right? If this man is not going to marry you by this time, you need to know as a woman, this is this is above me now, okay? This is beyond my pay because it's not wise for you as a woman to take yourself off the dating market at the prime of your life where you have the highest value in the dating market. It doesn't make any sense. And you're playing pat a kick for six to nine years. It doesn't make any sense. So you have to know, hey, if, if I stay here for longer than this amount of time, Am I preventing my husband from finding me because I'm committed to this man? So whatever that is for you, it has to be true to you. Don't just try to copy what I'm doing because it's going to backfire. 
but your self-esteem has to be at that point. If it's not six months and it's one year, then let it be one year. If it's two years, that's your own. It's two years. I wouldn't do it. But if that's where you're at, it's better that you just walk through it, right? And you build up your self-esteem so that you really understand your value and your worth and really what makes sense and remove yourself from a situation when it's not benefiting you. Okay, last one. And then we're going to be out. Last one. What are your thoughts on abstinence and courting for marriage? I have met men who say they are Christian, but not willing to wait. Yeah, the issue is in today's society. Listen, that's why I said, look, man, feminism, sure, they had some good stuff, but it really didn't benefit women as far as the sexual revolution. Okay, this idea of we can be like men, the sexual revolution is to, is to blame. Okay, so men in this age, they do not have to wait. Why? Because sex is freely accessible. Back then, men had to marry to get sex. Women are no longer requiring men to marry to have sex. So the best thing you can do as a woman in this situation is either A, my husband and I, we talk about it. One of two things. A, you either find a man who's already abstinent on his own, or B, find a man who's going to be abstinent for you. B will probably be your best bet, especially in the game of hypergamy, because usually when a man is already abstinent, it's either rare or there's a reason why he's abstinent because he's not very high value in the dating market. Okay, let's just be real, right? Like women would not gravitate to him in the first place. So the second way that you can do that is, but to, to go the second way, have a man be absent for you, you have to be his dream girl. You have to be what he's looking for. And I know that that hurts to say, but a man is not, why would he? He doesn't have to, right? But if you're not what he's looking for and he has no reason to be absent or to marry you, you know, he's just kind of scoping things out, which is why in One at Love, when we're coaching women and we're, you know, ha when we're coaching women in the date to marry market, we don't sit and, and coach women who want to be um, in a relationship for three, five years. Mm -mm, no, because it really doesn't make sense. You want a man to be absent for you and you're keeping them waiting for two, three years. No. No, and they're not a virgin? No, no, uh-uh. And you're not a virgin? No. Mm -mm. It's better to vet quickly, pick a man who's ready for marriage, show up as his dream girl, right? And really push that marriage. Not push, like as a woman, like you're not being pushy, but show up as a wife. For my husband, like I said, he knew I was a wife, I was his dream girl, so he had a choice. What are you gonna do? right? You're not going to get consistent sex from me without ring. What are you going to do? So he just married. He went ahead and married me out of faith. Why? Because I was who he wanted to be with. But six months, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> like you can't expect a man who is high value. Like my husband was a high value man in the marketplace, right? To be celibate for or abstinent rather for two, three years, is just not, it's not realistic, right? It's better to just get the white man paperwork and go have sex in peace. <laughs> Honestly, vet quickly, right? Know what you're looking for. Both of you are looking for marriage and marry quickly. Like some of our clients, two of them, they're on their way to marriage. We, we expect them to be married probably next month. And then the other one, the month after one woman, she was in our course. But she already is getting married, um, I think in two days, actually. Um, but they were only dating for a few months. They're getting married. Next. So. Hey. Tanti law, tanti law. Okay, so we're done. <laughs> we're done. I'm sorry. Hey, it's two. Hey. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Ariel, for um, um, helping us with <laughs> the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining. Please put this on Instagram. Tag us if you had like some video clips or whatnot. Join our Facebook group, okay? And put what you've learned in the Facebook group, like make a post so that we can see. If you had a question that was not answered, 
make sure that you do put it in the wall, on the Facebook wall, in the group. Okay? Thank you guys so much. See you guys soon. Make sure you follow us at Golly Femme. Bye, everybody. Oh, Thank you.